One of the saddest verses of the Bible is an introduction to one of the great lives of Scripture. I'm reading from the last verse of the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Judges is a book of apostasies, declensions, fallings away. The judges were really saviors, redeemers. One by one they came because God loved his rebel people. There was one called Samson, who at last stands between two pillars and willingly dies that he might deliver his people. Pointing to the great Samson, because Samson is included among the heroes of faith by Hebrews 11 because of his penitence and because he actually did fulfill the prophecy made at his birth. He shall save his people. Judges chapter 13. They're the words that are quoted at the birth of Jesus. Call his name Jesus, for he'll save his people. Christ is the real Samson, who stood between two other uprights and willingly died, thus destroying his great enemy, the devil, and freeing his own people. But at the end of the book, after saviour after saviour has been used by God, the record is, but there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I want you to notice now the end of the next book. <coughs> the next book is Ruth, and the last word is David. The reason for the book of Ruth is to tell us of the ancestors of King David. So at the end of Judges, there's no king. At the end of Ruth, the name of a man is introduced whose name is repeated over a thousand times in the Old Testament. And yet there's only one David. There's more than one Enoch. There's more than one Judas. Many characters in Scripture have their doubles or triplicates. Not so David. This man named a thousand times is only one man. Only one man bears his name in the Old Testament. He's mentioned 58 times in the New. He wrote over 90 Psalms. And he's one of the best types of our Lord Jesus Christ, despite his follies. Every type is like a shadow, and every shadow is a distortion. Sometimes the types teach by way of contrast. Where David sinned, our Lord never sinned. But David was a good shepherd, a king, a prophet, was born at Bethlehem. His name means the beloved. In all these ways, he points to the son of David born in the same city as David, like David to be a prophet and a king and the best of all good shepherds. So, judges, there's no king. Ruth introduces the king, the last word. Then come the two books of Samuel that would have been better called the books of David because Samuel drops out after a few chapters. They're not two books about Samuel. They're two books about David. He first becomes prominent in 1 Samuel in chapter 16 where the Lord says to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, seeing I've rejected him? Now please note, Saul was still king, but God had rejected him. It's possible for a church, an institution, or a person to be rejected of God and yet have their lives prolonged. Israel was rejected at the cross when they said, We'll not have this man to reign over us. We have no king but Caesar but they existed for another 40 years before the city fell. So God says, I've rejected Saul, but he's still king. Go and anoint David. <coughs> so you know the story that when he sees the sons of Jesse, and among whom he's told the new kings to be found, when he sees Eliab, he thinks, this must be him. And the Lord says, no, don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. I've rejected him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. And there's an important principle here. The first king of Israel, head and shoulders above his brethren, strong, handsome, everyone wanted him. The second king is the king after God's own heart, not the first. Saul plays the fool, but the second king, it's different. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 46. That which is first is not spiritual, but carnal and afterwards that which is spiritual. 
So the first generation of Israel, carnal, dies in the wilderness. Second generation, by faith, enter the land. First king of Israel, carnal. The second one, a man after God's own heart. Wherever you have two brothers in the book of Genesis, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Ishmael and Isaac, same story. Firstborn, carnal. Second, ultimately, spiritual. It's not trying to tell us about firstborns today, it's only a parable. You remember the last plague was on the firstborn. What does it all mean? It means what John chapter 3, the thousandth chapter of Scripture tells us. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once, if at all. So when we look at the second king of Israel, he's telling us something about our own nature. Our own nature is like Saul. But we need to be born again. When we meet David, he's a shepherd, just a stripling, just a teenager. But notice where he becomes prominent. Look at the next chapter. It says, The Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succoth, which belongs to Judah. Saul, the men of Israel, gathered and encamped in a valley and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Then it lists six items of armour. He stood and shouted, Why have you come out to draw up the battle? I'm a Philistine, your servants of Saul. Choose a man to fight with me. Here is a picture of good and evil. And instead of the two armies fully entangling and fighting, there's a representative from each. Where the scripture says that Goliath claims to be a champion, the Hebrew word means a mediator, an umpire. And here we have a picture of the world, the good and evil forces, forces of Satan like the Philistines, forces of God like the Israelites, but there's a representative for each. And the representative of Israel in this story is King David who looks so puny beside Goliath. Now the previous chapter spoke of him being anointed. And you remember that after God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the next thing he was driven out into a wilderness to meet a giant. And that's exactly the order here. 1 Samuel 16, David, the beloved of Bethlehem, is anointed by the Spirit. The next chapter, he goes out to the wilderness to meet a giant. Notice what happens. Verse 16, for 40 days, and of course that's the same as Matthew 4, where after our Lord's anointing, for 40 days he's tangling with the giant, the devil. The Philistine came, took his stand. Then it regresses a little, and we see the scene at Jesse's home, David's home. Jesse the father says to David his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain, these ten loaves, carry them quickly to the camp. Take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See how your brothers fare and bring some token from them. Notice how it's very much like Genesis 37 where Joseph's father says, go down to your brethren. See how they're doing. And when he goes down there, the brethren hate him. What will happen to David when he goes down to his brethren? It tells us in verse 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when David spoke to the men. His anger was kindled against David. Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. You've come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done? What have I done? It's just like the story of Genesis. David comes. He didn't have a mule. He carries all these things on his back. Like Joseph, he's wandering, wandering, trying to find these men. He finds them at last to do them good, but they hate him and they criticize him. And David gives a similar reply to Christ. Christ said, what evil have I done? Testify against me. That's what David said. What evil have I done? He goes to Saul and says he's going to fight Goliath. Saul tries to discourage him. 
David talks about what he's done before. He's fought with lions and he's fought with bears and God has used him. And so David is motivated to fight the giant. Number one, he feels that God's honour is at stake. Why should this uncircumcised giant defy the armies of the living God? Secondly, David loves his people. But there was a third motive. Saul had offered the king's daughter to whoever overcame the, the giant. God's name is to be vindicated. God's people are to be delivered. And David wants to marry the daughter. It was the same with Jesus. He came to vindicate God. What a slander on God that our universe in this particular planet is filled with evil. What a slander on God. God has to do something about it or he's not God. So he sent David to Bethlehem. The David we call Christ. Secondly, Christ came to save his people, like David. Thirdly, Christ came to marry his church, as David was to marry the daughter of the king. David refuses the armour that's offered him by Saul, takes simple armour, reminds us of Christ in the wilderness. All he will use is stones out of the book of Scripture. It is written. David has simple weapons like that. And yet they're the best weapons. If he had a sword and got close to Goliath, Goliath would have finished him. With a sling, he doesn't have to get that close. God's weapons are the very best. And so he approaches the giant, and you know the words that they interchange, but I want you to notice the climax, verse 51. After he's catapulted a stone that went into the giant's forehead, so he fell, it says, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. This is a marvellous picture. The cross of Calvary was an inverted sword, and the devil's hand was on it. The devil was the Goliath that was going to spear Christ, bruise his heel. But Christ took the devil's weapon of the cross and by it he beheaded the great giant. By death, says scripture in Hebrews 2.14, he destroyed him that had the power of death and delivered those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage because of their fear of death. So Christ now holds up the cross. So just as Israel rejoiced and knew they'd been freed, that the great enemy was overcome, defeated. So now as we look to the cross, whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, and I confess I find it much easier to preach about than to practice, but all life is practicing. And we must learn to look at the uplifted cross and see in it the sign that all the things we fear they're all defeated. You remember when the disciples were in the ship and it seems they were going to plummet down, they're going to die, drown in Galilee, they suddenly see someone walking on the water, walking on the crests of the billows, as if to say, everything that threatens to come down on your head and destroy you, it's all under my feet. And if you and I can learn that, life will be so much better, so much easier, if we can understand that everything that threatens us, Christ has encountered. Every thorn his feet have trodden down. He's trodden every step of the way and he has overcome all of the world, all of the flesh and all of the devil. And his victory is for us, just as David's victory was for all Israel. There the Israelites are throwing their helmets in the air saying, we've won, we've won. David had won. And you and I can say, we've won. For Christ, the representative of the world, has defeated the representative of evil and even taken his own weapon and beheaded the devil with it. I want you to notice an incident in the life of this great king. And I'm turning to 2 Samuel and chapter 9. And David said, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul, and they called him to David, and the king said, Are you Ziba? He said, Yes. Is there someone of the house of Saul? I may show the kindness of God to him. And Ziba said to the king, There's still the son of Jonathan, but he's a cripple. The king said, Where is he? He's in the house of Maker at Lodibar, which means a place of no pasture. 
King David sent and brought him from the house. And Mephibosheth came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. David said, Mephibosheth, he answered, Behold your servant. David said to him, Don't fear. I'll show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'll restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. You'll always eat food at my table. The exiled prince says, What is your servant? You should look upon such a dead dog as I am. But then we read, He sat at David's table like one of the king's sons, though he was lame in both his feet. My friends, you and I, like Mephibosheth, are lame. He was lame by a fall. I told you about it in the fourth chapter of this book. His nurse trying to rescue him when the army had been defeated of his own country, tripped as she's running out of the nursery with the infant prince. And when she's hiding in a cave, she looks at his feet and both feet are swollen. Hurriedly, she takes him over the mountains into exile, into a land called the land of Lodibar, a place of no pasture. And there the exile crippled prince grows up until one day he sees a horseman ride over those same mountains he'd crossed as a boy, as an infant. And there's a man in royal robes and he says, I'm the messenger of the king. King David wants to see you. And Mephibosheth thinks he's going to kill me. I'm descendant of Saul, his enemy. But when he comes to David, David talks to him kindly. He says, you're going to be like one of my sons. You're going to be a prince again. You're going to eat at my table. I'm going to give you a royal robe. It'll cover those feet of yours. And I'm going to make provision for you all the rest of the days of your life. And we too were lame by a fall. We fell in our great representative in Eden. We were born lame on both our feet spiritually. We can't walk straight. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. The leopard can no more change his spots than we can change our inclination to do evil. We're just the same as the Ethiopian who can't change his skin. We can't change ours. But a messenger of the gospel comes to us and many of us can think back of how it happened. And we heard that the king we defended by rebellion loves us and is inviting us home. If he'll come home, he'll make us a prince again. We'll eat at his table. He'll give us a royal robe again. We'll be his special children. Why did this happen? Well, David had made a covenant with Jonathan. And our God made a covenant with his son. And we are the beneficiaries of that covenant. I recommend to you the story of Mephibosheth, for it's our story. We moral cripples are given the place of the prince at the table of the king because of the gospel invitation of our David. Now there's another section I want you to consider <coughs> further on in this book. It tells of the time when King David, because of rebellion, crossed over the book Kedron and went into Gethsemane and then went up Mount Olivet. I'm reading to you from 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. And all the people wept aloud as all the people passed by and the king crossed the brook Kedron and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And so he goes into the wilderness that we know as Gethsemane, having crossed that brook that's spoken of in John chapter 18. After the Lord's Supper, because of the rebellion of his people, Christ took his disciples over that same brook as David had gone over a thousand years before, to the same place where David went to pray. What did David pray when he got to his Gethsemane? It tells us. Verse 26, If God says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. In other words, David was praying in Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. So he comes across the book Kedron, the rejected king, he, in Gethsemane, he surrenders his will to God. And then in verse 30, David went up the ascent of Mount of Olives, weeping as he went up, bare feet with his head covered. And it was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Please note, 
and David wrote about mine own familiar friend and whom I trusted has lifted up my heel against me. He was referring to his good friend Ahistopel, who ultimately betrayed him. What happened to Ahistopel finally? The scripture has a magnificent verse. As he went to his home, he heard some news about David, he set his house in order and he hanged himself. That's the typological basis of what happened between Jesus and Judas. Jesus washed the feet of Judas, pleading with him to return. The traitor hardened his heart. This Christ's own familiar friend betrays him. But later, when conscience is awoken, he goes back to the priests and throws them the money. I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Seven times around the cross you have the statement about Christ being innocent. You have it from Pilate, this just man. You have it from Pilate's wife, have nothing to do with this just man. You have it from the centurion who watches the, the death. You have it from Judas. Seven times it's said by different characters, he's innocent. And Judas says he's innocent. And Ahithophel now realises that he has betrayed his friend and his friend didn't deserve it. His friend was innocent. So Ahithophel suicides. Just like Judas, or should we say Judas suicides, just like a histopel. Let me read you something else before we close this session. It tells us that in the great battle that took place, Absalom, that beautiful looking prince with a horrid evil heart, is with the armies to overthrow the one who gave him life. And as he leads his armies through the woods, it says in verse 9, Absalom chanced to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule. The mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast to the oak. And please observe, it says he was left hanging between heaven and earth. This is a great story. He is a son of the king. Beautiful from head to foot. It stresses that in the record. And only rarely does the Bible describe people's physical appearance. But this rebel's appearance is described because he's a symbol of Satan. Given life by God, beautiful from head to feet, but betrays the source of his life. But what is the destiny of Satan? Absalom causes life giver to be exiled, to go over the book Kedron, to go into Gethsemane, to go weeping up Mount of Olives. But Absalom ultimately is caught by a tree and he's left hanging between heaven and earth. And so Satan, who causes King Jesus to be dethroned from the hearts of his own people, is caught at the tree of the cross. You know, the trees in the Bible are often significant. When you first meet a tree, it's the place of the curse. Later on, angels come to visit Abraham and he says, rest yourselves under the tree. Now the tree is a place of rest. But ultimately, the tree is a place of tremendous suffering and horror and evil, but also of victory, of triumph. For it's at the cross of Calvary that the one who'd bruised the Saviour's heel had his head crushed. Satan suicided when he slew our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you and I read the story of this man whose name means the beloved, who's born in Bethlehem, who never loses a battle when he's leading forth the Lord's people, this man who's a prophet and a king and a good shepherd, you and I are meant to see one greater than David one who wasn't ashamed to be called the son of David, who was the best shepherd of all, the greatest of the prophets, king of kings, lord of lords, began at Bethlehem, but he ends at Calvary, where for you and for me, he gained a victory over the Goliath that threatens us in the world, the flesh and the devil, and his victory is ours.